you've been with us for a while now, at least for the last several months, uh, we were in the book of Galatians. Now, we're moving on from there, and some of you may know where we're going. So if you're a guest with us this morning, I want to encourage you to keep coming from this point, because we're starting a new book. And one of the most important things that, that I want to teach you is the importance of context. When it comes to teaching and learning and growing in Scripture, the most important thing of all of it is context. We want to know what it says, why it says it, when it said it, to understand what God meant by it. Amen? Because you can take, as I've said before, you can take any Scripture, any passage of Scripture, and, and pull it out from everything around it and, and basically create a whole new religion out of just one verse. People do it all the time. They say uh, a text out of context is a pretext for whatever you want it to say. Whatever you want to believe. That's, that's not what we, we teach here. Uh, certainly as believers, but even as Southern Baptists as we are, and I don't often affiliate myself with Southern Baptists, not for any other reason than I just like to tell people I believe the book. Amen? But one of the things Southern Baptists have been known for as of late, they've had their problems, trust me. But what they've been known for is believing that this is the authority. This is the word of God. It's inerrant. It's complete. It's everything God wants us to have, and there's no mistakes in it. That's what we believe. That's what I believe. Amen? Amen. And so I come here to, I, I say all that about Southern Baptists to tell you this. If Southern Baptists ever stop believing that this is the authority and the word of God, I'm not going to be a Southern Baptist. That's right. I'm a Christian, I'm a Bible-believing Christian at that, first and foremost beyond any of it, okay? Amen? Amen? I hope you all feel that way. I hope you're not tied down to a denomination. Because I promise you, one day we're going to get to heaven, we're not going to see denominations. That's right. <laughs> I won't be there. There's not going to be a Baptist section, a Methodist section, a Presbyterian section. None of that. I won't be there. You're going to get up there and you're going to see born again, washed by the blood, believers in Jesus Christ. That's what you're going to see. That's the most important thing. Amen? But I hope you got the Bible. And I hope you read the Bible. And I hope you take everything I say from behind this pulpit and you put it to the test. Amen? Mm -hmm. I will summarize what we went over last week. We completed the book of Galatians or the letter of Galatians last week. Of course, that was written by Paul. A, Paul, uh, a letter that Paul wrote to, to a Galatian church, a Gentile church, a, a pagan church, a people that... That were Gentiles or didn't know the God of the Old Testament, but by grace through faith came to know Christ, and thereby, therefore, therefore, thereby, were grafted in. Amen? Amen? And so Paul is writing to this church, and as he ended his letter to them, he kind of summarized the whole point of Galatians. And we talked about that last week. He, he first talked about the problem with legalism. He talked about those who had come into this Gentile church, and they were Jewish. Uh, what I would call Pharisees, these people that were coming in and saying, yeah, Jesus is great, but you Gentiles, you need to start doing Jewish things in order to be saved. You need to be circumcised like us Jews are in order to be saved. And, and Paul said, listen, that, that's heresy. We are saved by grace through faith alone, period, nothing else. And so he talks about the problem of legalism. What it does is exalt self over the Savior. It says, I and what I believe and what I think is much more important than what Jesus said. That's what legalism does, right? It says, you've got to obey these laws because I say you need to obey these laws. Because it makes me look good if you do what I say, right? It makes me look like I'm a guy of influence. It makes me look more holy if you do these things. What does that do? It exalts up. It's an egoism in the church. And there's a problem with egoism in the church. I think we see that today. Maybe not to the extent that they saw it in that day. But I think we certainly do see it in the church today. When I talk about the church, I'm talking about believers everywhere around the world. And it often comes out in legalism. I talk about that. When you see persecution in, in the Bible, these, these heresies and these heretics, they don't come from the lost world, the pagan world. They come from within the religious world. So we've got to be careful of ourselves not to be legalists because it's easy to do. Amen? Some of us are very analytical in life. I'm included in this, by the way. I, I like to have a, a list of, okay, if I do these things, I'm good. But the whole principle of the Old Testament, as Paul taught, was it's not about doing those things. I wrote all these things to show you that you can't do these things and you need Jesus. 
So he pointed out the problem with legalism in ending that book of Galatia, or the letter of Galatia. He also talked about the principle of salvation. Because Paul clarified it then and there for the Galatian church, and anybody talking about circumcision, he said, listen, circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision, it's nothing. It means nothing. The only thing that matters is a new creation. Amen? And that's gospel. None of this easy believism stuff that you can walk down an aisle and say a prayer at an altar and walk away and think you've been saved and live like hell the rest of your life. The Bible teaches that anybody who turns from their sin to Jesus and is saved by grace through faith, it says they become a new creation. God puts a new heart within them, gives them new desires, and backs it up with the Holy Spirit that teaches them and leads them and moves them to the things of God. That's what matters. That's the principle of salvation is new creation. Are you new? That's a question I challenged you with last week. Have you become new? I think that's a question we have to ask ourselves. The Bible tells us to examine our hearts, to test our hearts often. Why? Because if you look around, you can tell there are a lot of people who have made professions of faith. They've been baptized. They've joined a church. They give them their tithe. They do all of those things. But when you really see their hearts... There's never been a new creation. They've never been born again. Y'all, there's a difference between what you know here and what happens here. The principle of the gospel is a new creation. That's what matters. Are you new? And then finally, Paul talks about the product of our faith. That's how he kind of ends the letter to the Galatians. He said, listen, if your mind is there, if that's where your focus is, right? If you live by this rule, what rule? The rule of the new creation. If you become a new creation, that's your focus. You're not worried about all these legalistic standards and lists of rules and regulations. If your mind is focused on Christ and following Him by grace and faith alone, peace and mercy will rule in your heart. That's the product of the new creation. That's the product of Bible-believing, born-again faith is peace and mercy. And by the way, what he talked about, the fruit of the Spirit in the chapter before, love, mercy. Gentleness, kindness, self-control. That's a big one, amen? Those are the natural outflows of a heart focused on Christ, saved by grace. Amen? That's a good way to end the letter. And really, he kind of threw in one thing at the end. He goes, yeah, now quit bothering me with this junk. That's how Paul really ended the letter. He said at the end, I'm just don't cause me any more trouble. <laughs> amen? I think he expected to receive a little bit more, but I love his appeal to the church. All right, now. You got it? Good. Leave me alone. <laughs> so now, I want to remind you, Galatian was a letter written by an ex-Pharisee, someone who knew the law. If anybody was tempted to be legalistic, it was Paul. He knew the law. He strove to obey the law. He persecuted the church by the law. And then he was born again Christian. Amen? So here's an ex-Pharisee Writing a letter in Galatians to what? An ex-pagan people. Do you see the dichotomy there? The highest of the religious is writing a letter to the lowest of the non-religious. And they're on equal footing in Christ. That's the principle of Galatians. That's a beautiful picture, by the way. I love that picture. Today we're going to start a letter that's completely different than that. I mean completely different. If you haven't already, I'm going to ask that you turn to the book of James. Turn to the book of James this morning. If you have a Bible, it's right after Hebrews. It's close to the end. You've got James, and you've got First and Second Peter, and I think First, Second, Third John, and maybe I'm wrong. If you look at the thing, it's towards the end of the Bible. Amen. Look for the book of James, the letter of James. It's not a book, or it's not a letter written by the Apostle Paul. So you're going to see some differences there. They're going to use some wording that is different. There is a noticeable difference also in what this book or this letter does not have that all of Paul's letters have. And in fact, this was a very big point of contention as the church was coming together and figuring out what books belonged and what we have today called the Bible. The word's called uh, canonized. The canonized books of the Bible. James was low on the list of the books that people wanted put in to what the Bible we have today. One of the reasons is, is as you, we read through all Paul's letters, and by the way, I've preached through several of Paul's letters from this pulpit in the last nine and a half years. I've been here a while, okay? 
One thing that Paul does, and he does often, is remind us of the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul is constantly bringing up the gospel. Constantly talking about the new creation in Christ. He's constantly doing these things. James does not mention the gospel at all. Did you know that? Now, when we get what we call the Protestant movement, when we really broke out of Catholicism, was a man named Martin Luther. You've probably heard of him. Martin Luther hated the book of James. He hated it for this very purpose. Luther's focus was highly on the gospel, as it should have been, by the way. But uh, Luther referred to this letter as a, an epistle of straw. He found it to be very weak. He didn't want it to be in what we have today, but ultimately decided that it belonged in what we have today. Because as we're going to find out as we go through this letter, there is nothing that contradicts anything written in the New Testament. There is no disagreement between Paul and James. None. But you're going to see a very different perspective. Amen? Now, that being said, we're going to introduce the book. And James introduces the book in the first verse, and then he gets right into teaching. So you and I are only going to cover the first verse, okay? If you're there, in James chapter 1, I'm going to read verse 1. James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Simple greetings. Paul's greetings were much longer than that. Paul went into how blessed and how thankful I am and you're in my prayers and I love you and Jesus is awesome. And all. Paul had long introductions. James is very abrupt, very done, right? Now, who wrote the letter of James? We said, well, it's James, Pastor. It says it right there. Well, it may not be the James you think when I talk about James. The most common person that we think of when we say the name James, we probably associate one of the twelve disciples, one of the original twelve apostles. That is James, the son of Zebedee. His brother was John. They were considered the sons of thunder, right? They're, these were awesome guys of, of those twelve. And so you naturally think, well, this book of James, certainly one of the th sons of thunder wrote this letter. No, no, it wasn't that James. We're going to find out who actually wrote this, this letter. And one of the reasons we know it wasn't that James is because James was actually put to death early on at the start of the church. Did y'all know that? John's brother James, we see in Acts chapter 12, verse 2, Herod had been put to death fairly quickly. This letter was written after the death of that James. In fact, that James is not even the James, James, the son of Zebedee, the, the son of thunder. He was not even the pastor of Jerusalem. That's this James. The leader of the church in Jerusalem. It wasn't the apostle. It wasn't the disciple. This is someone who Paul actually referred to at the beginning of Galatians. Interestingly enough, in Galatians chapter 1 verse 19, he introduced this James as the half-brother of Jesus. <coughs> the Messiah's own brother. That means he was Mary and John's, or Joseph, Mary and John, Mary and Joseph's son, James. Now listen, that's going to take us to a whole new level as well. That's going to separate us from a lot of bad theology out there. A lot of bad denominational theology, by the way. Because one thing we know, if James being associated as one of uh, Mary and Joseph's children, that points out one fact that one denomination out there, I don't even know if you consider them a denomination, uh, that don't believe, and that is Catholicism. Maybe you're wondering about Catholicism today. Catholicism believes that Mary... Though she was a virgin when Jesus was born, they believe that she remained a virgin the rest of her life. And they worship her for that, by the way. They pray to her as the Virgin Mary. Listen, y'all. Husbands, y'all can testify. You didn't marry your wife so she remained a virgin. Amen? We tend to, and I think some people do, put sex, and forgive me children uh, when I talk about this, but put sex on this pedestal of, ooh, that's something gross, that's something negative, that's something bad, that's something evil. Listen, God created it. That's right. God ordained it. God orchestrated it for marriage. It's something beautiful. It's something sanctified and holy before God in the confines of marriage. Amen? Amen. 
Mary indeed was a virgin when Jesus was born, but I promise you she did not say that. She had other children, James being one of them. You know who else? Jude. You ever read the book of Jude? That was also a half-brother of Jesus, James's brother. And we see them listed in Matthew chapter 13, verse 55. In fact, we see in that passage four boys named. And in the next verse it says there were several other sisters as well. I want, to, I want you to know Jesus had brothers, physical brothers in this world, half-brothers. Children of Mary and Joseph. Well, this is who's writing this letter. James, a brother of Jesus. I'll tell you why it's going to matter here in just a second. Amen? Because I think in this simple introduction, that bears a part of what we learn about James and what this letter is going to be about. Remember, this is part of context. When we go into this letter, we need to know what we're getting into. Who's writing it? Why they're writing it? When it was written? To whom it was written? We're going to see three things that I want to point out to this. And one of them based on the fact that James was Jesus' brother. The first thing that we're going to learn is this is a letter based in humility. It's a very humble letter. Now it's going to be tough. And this is why we need to learn this. But when you read this letter, it's very forward. It's very black and white. It's very much do these things. But we have to remember when we're reading these commands, these instructions that we are to live by, it's coming from a heart that truly is humbled before God. Keep that in mind as we go through this letter. He opens it up saying, I am James, a bondservant of God, listen, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is James, the brother of Jesus, now announcing himself as a bondservant, or if your translation perhaps says, a slave. To Jesus. Y'all, how many have siblings? Seriously. How is the thought to you of you being a slave to your brother or your sister, your sibling? What well, a humiliating thought, isn't it? I can tell you, I have many brothers, and not one of them I would want to serve as a slave. That is humiliating, and I won't do it. Amen? But understand. The context. This is James saying, I am a slave to Jesus. Think of that. Think of James being a brother of Jesus. Think of what his life must have been like growing up. Think of the humility he had just growing up, the shame perhaps he felt growing up, the, the comparisons he would have had upon himself. Maybe his parents would have had. Can you imagine growing up and being at the dinner table and you're eating and, oh, I don't want to finish this food. And, and Mary being like, hey, come on, James. Jesus ate all his vegetables. <laughs> really? James, I can't believe you're throwing this fit. Jesus never gives me sass. Ain't he Mr. Perfect? Y'all, y'all, we all feel that way, don't we, about our siblings? Oh, aren't they so much better? Oh, aren't they high and mighty? But listen, in James' case, his brother was perfect. His brother, brother was the high and mighty one. Imagine how much pressure James felt in his life with Jesus, the Son of God, as his older brother. Do you think he ever fought with Jesus? Do you think he ever argued with Jesus? Do you ever think he talked back to Jesus or talked bad about Jesus? Y'all y'all know in your heart, you know that he did. You know he was struggling with that through his whole life. Even into adulthood, by the way. You might not notice, but in... Um, turn my paper over. In John chapter 7... In John chapter 7, verse 5, the Bible tells us that his own Jesus, his own brothers, when he came to his hometown, didn't even believe in him. So even James, as an adult, grew, grew, grew up with this perfect example, the Son of God, his whole life, and now this, this guy, his brother, comes out saying, I am the Messiah, I am the Christ, I am the one sent from heaven of God to save you from your sins. And James is over here going... Whatever. Why do you think he felt that way? It wasn't because Jesus didn't perform miracles. It wasn't because Jesus wasn't fulfilling prophecy. 
Certainly you saw that. I've got to attest to you today. I feel it's probably because James dealt with a lot of hard-heartedness and stubbornness. And his own guilt and shame that had racked him for so many years. He just set himself in opposition to Christ. I'm just not going to believe. Maybe you find yourself in that position today. Maybe some of you are so hard-hearted and hurt that you just will not believe. I think you'll relate to James a little bit. Now, obviously, James did believe at some point. At what point that is, I don't know. The Bible does not tell us. But obviously, something happened in James's life. Maybe it was the resurrection. Again, I, I'm just telling you. Maybe James held out his doubts until he could just no longer do it. When he saw his brother on the cross, being crucified, spat upon, whipped, beaten, hanging there, blood dripping from his bones. Maybe in those moments, James saw his brother in all of his agony and all of his pain, reflected on all that he had done, mourned the loss of his brother, and then three days later, the shock of his life when this flesh and blood person came out of the grave, introduced himself, and James was like, you are, you are God. And in that moment, he gave his life. Not to a brother, but to a Savior, to a Messiah. Can you imagine that? And not just a believer, by the way, but a leader to go on and lead the first church planted, established through the Holy Spirit, the church in Jerusalem. That's where James led. What an amazing thing that is to think about. This is a letter of humility, y'all. This is a man who wrestled with his own flesh, wrestled in his own sin, watched Jesus his entire life in stubborn rebellion until finally he can no longer deny it anymore. He fell on his knees before the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, someone who he looked at as a sibling his whole life, but now saw as the Savior of the world. And he is writing this letter from that aspect. I serve my Lord. Jesus. That's hard, y'all. That's heavy. Not only is this a letter of humility, we need to understand another thing today. This is a letter written to Hebrews, to Jews, to Israel. Remember, Paul wrote to Galatians was a pagan people, a, a, a Gentile people saved by grace. James is writing this to, as he said in verse 1, to the twelve Tribes. Y'all, there's no 12 tribes in Gentilism. Amen? He's referring to the 12 tribes of Israel. He's writing to Jews. And by the way, he calls them brothers later on. So they're not just strictly Jews. They are Jews who had saw Christ accepted Him as their promised Messiah. These Jews who knew the prophecies, knew the promises, had read the law, had been raised up in who God was and what He was doing and what He was going to do, and they themselves had come to the knowledge, the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. They had been born again, but they're Jewish. Amen? Another way to back this up, as if it wasn't obvious enough, writing to the twelve tribes, you'll see in chapter 2 of James, verse 2, I want you to look at it with me. James is giving instruction to this, this gathering. If a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring. Does your version say assembly? Does somebody, does somebody have a different version that says something other than assembly? No? How many of you have margins in your Bible? Have notes that are written in the center or at the bottom of the page? Now... That word assembly, oftentimes in the Pauline letters and in much of the New Testament, that's translated in Greek, that's the word ekklesia. That's where we get the word church, the gathering of God's people, the gathering of Christians. That is not the word used here. That's not the word James uses. The word assembly in the Greek here is the word synagogue. Synagogue is the Jewish temple. This tells me that the Jews who had come to know Jesus as their Messiah were still meeting in the synagogues. 
That's where they worshipped. So that just further backs up the truth, the fact that when James is writing this letter, he is writing it to a Hebrew Jewish people. He wasn't writing to a pagan nation that didn't know God. He was writing to a people that knew God, knew the promises, knew who the Messiah was, and knew what Jesus fulfilled. I think this is further back up in why James doesn't feel the need to remind them of the gospel, like Paul does. Paul does it so much, but remember he's talking to a pagan people. James is talking to a people that already know the gospel. They had it back in the Old Testament, amen? And they saw it fulfilled in Christ. So, so James is writing with the presupposition these people know. They know who the Messiah is. They know the importance of who he was or who he is and what it means to be saved. I think that's a big thing in our understanding of what this letter is going to say. It's the Jesus, it's the, the Messiah they've already been expecting. So they didn't need the constant reminder. So this is a letter written in humility. It is written to a Hebrew people, people who knew who Christ was. They knew the, 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 the gospel. But finally, what he shows us in this opening verse is paramount to everything we're going to read next. And we're going to start in that, not next Sunday. Remember, I won't be here, but the Sunday after. This is a letter written for hardship. I mean, you're going through a hardship right now. This letter's for you. Why do I know it's a letter written for hardship? He said, I'm writing this. I am James, bond slave, bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes who are what? Dispersed abroad. That word dispersed sounds kind of pleasant, doesn't have kind of a sharpness to it, but I want you to know that letter or that word can also be scattered. That puts a little bit more of a t twist on it. You know, he's writing to these people, these Jewish people who have accepted the Messiah, who've just received hope and glory and grace and peace, and then because of their faith, were then persecuted, imprisoned, killed, rejected from their own homes, many of them kicked out of their own houses by parents, by elders, by family members whom they loved and were with the whole life, and all of a sudden, just because they put their faith in Jesus, now they were kicked out and ran out of town on a rail, and they had to go and survive on their own and find their way. They were literally scattered abroad. And we know this happened for, by persecution because we read it in Acts chapter 8. Or in chapter 8. Chapter 8, that's funny. Chapter 8. Interestingly enough, do you know who started that main thrust of persecution? The writer of Galatians. Paul, or as his name was at the time, Saul, that Pharisee. He led the persecution against the Jews. He led the hatred, the anger, the animosity, the violence that flowed out of the Jewish people who would not believe in the Messiah. He led that attack on these believers simply because they put their faith in Jesus. I want to tell you, y'all, they lost everything. They lost work. They lost houses. They lost families. They lost so much and were scattered all over the place. I want you to know this morning, there's not a hurt that you face today that these people that James is writing to do not understand. They understand hurt. They understand pain. And I would even attest to you today, and I don't know your situation, I don't know what you're going through, but I, I can almost tell you with almost 100% certainty that none of us here today truly understand the pain that these people endure. And thank God for that. We live truly in a blessed nation. Now our nation has turned its back on God largely. I think we're falling under some, uh, some judgment. And I think we can see that scripturally. And I can take you through that scripture on another day. But I'm telling you, we still today live in the land of the free. The fact that we are gathered here today in this building in the air conditioning and under the lights without worry about somebody busting through those doors and arresting us and locking us up. I'm not talking about a crazy terrorist gunman. I'm talking about a police officer coming in and arresting us for our faith. The fact that we don't have that concern 
tells me everything I need to know that we don't even near understand pain and hurt and hardship like these people understand it. But that ought to be something that we need to remember as James pours out this instruction through this letter. Because you're going to hit some things and you're like, I don't want that. Can I encourage you today that the Bible wasn't written for you to like? It wasn't written for you even to agree with. You ought to, amen, if you believe it's God's word, you believe it's authoritative, you believe God wrote it to us to live by, we ought to agree with it. But I'm telling you right now, your agreement with it is not necessary. You don't have to like it. But I think we need to keep in mind those three things this morning as we enter into this letter and go take the next probably few months and dig through it and learn from it. We need to remember this is a book written in humility. It's something, if anybody had anything against Christ and his teachings, man, I'm telling you, it's the brother who grew up in the same house with him, who surrendered his own life. This, written, this letter was written in humility. We need to approach it in humility. Amen? We need to approach it in surrender, saying, God, this is your word. I may not always like it, but I'm going to believe it and trust it and obey it. Amen? Amen. This was written to a Hebrew people, meaning a people who knew God, knew the scriptures, knew the promises. And because they knew it, James can speak the way he did. Y'all, we need to look at this letter from that standpoint. We are a people. If you've been in this church any period of time, we've been going through the Bible. I'm telling you, you know the promise. You know the truth. You know the gospel. No, we're Gentiles today, but I promise you we're at a much different point than the Gentiles back then were. We know. We have the Word of God. And by the way, you have access to it at home. You don't have to rely on me or anybody else. You can read it for yourself. You know it. You need to come at it from that standpoint. I already know the promises. If I know the promises, I know this is true, then I shouldn't have any problem believing and obeying it either. And we need to come at it from the standpoint of this is a letter written to a people in hardship. God took into consideration your situation when he wrote it. You're not going to stand before God one day and say, God, I know what you wrote in here, but you didn't understand how hard my life was. That's not going to fly. God knows each of you here. He knows the very hairs on your head. He has them numbered. He knew you before you were formed in the womb. And guess what? He wrote you this book. You are not going to go to God and say, well, I didn't obey that book because you don't understand my situation. No. God wrote this because He understands your situation. And He wants the best for you. I challenge you, church, as we go through the book of James, I want you to lay every circumstance that you're going through, every hurt, every heartache, every hardship, I want you to lay it all down at the cross and say, God, I'm going to believe what you say in this book. And I'm going to put it above any of my own opinions, feelings, thoughts, ideals, all of it. Because I trust that you know what's best. Will you commit to doing that as we go through James? Amen? Will you commit to doing that? Say amen. Amen. Now let me ask you this. I'm glad you made the commitment. I hope you did make that commitment, by the way. I heard a lot of voices out there. Maybe yours was not among them. I only want to challenge you outside of the book of James with this, this truth. There's not one of us in here that doesn't need this book and the instruction there is. We are all fundamentally marred by sin. Not one of us is better than the other. Amen? We're on equal footing as sinners before an awesome, holy, righteous, perfect God. And we need His salvation. You need to understand that this morning. You need Jesus. I need Jesus. We all need Jesus. It will do you no good to try to learn from this book, to glean anything from this book, if you don't already come to Jesus in surrender and 
by faith and say, Jesus, I believe in you as Lord. In that confession, that, that the Bible says, if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, in that profession, you are saying, God, I believe that you are real. I believe that Jesus did as he said he did and died for all of my sins, past, present, and future sins, by the way. I believe Jesus paid for it all. And I surrender my life to you. I confess you as Lord. That means I believe you're going to be boss of my life. Everything else flows out of that. If you don't start there, you're not going to get anything else out of anything that this book has to say. So here's my challenge for you this morning. Have you surrendered your life to Christ? I'm not asking you if you've walked an aisle and prayed a prayer. I'm not asking you if you've been baptized. I'm not asking you if you are a member of 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 a church, this church or any other church. I'm asking you, have you been born again? Have you given your life to Christ? If the answer is no, today is the day. Surrender it to Jesus today. And then we will walk in the newness of life.